All right, this is concept one notes in our pathogens unit, and we're going to be talking about the structure and reproduction of both bacteria and viruses. So before we jump in, this unit is titled pathogens. So what are pathogens? They are disease-causing agents. This can be bacteria, it can be viruses, but it can also be other microorganisms. And something I really want to highlight is that only 1% of all bacteria are actually pathogens. So there's so much more about bacteria and viruses than just specifically causing disease. And so that's what this concept is about. I want to give you an overview of bacteria and, disease, and viruses separate from just talking about them in terms of them being pathogens. And also I wanna give us some clarification so that we can know the differences between the two because these often get confused. So we're gonna differentiate between them in terms of structure and reproduction and some other characteristics. So that's the goal of these notes. Okay, so let's start with bacteria. Main characteristics, they are prokaryotic unicellular organisms. So when I say organism, that means they are living things. All of the characteristics of life that we've talked about apply to bacteria. And because they're prokaryotes, that means they're made of prokaryotic cells. But all bacteria are unicellular organisms, meaning they're made of just one cell. And that cell is a prokaryotic cell. So if you remember from our cells unit, all cells, whether they're prokaryotes or eukaryotes, have cytoplasms, ribosomes, cell membranes, and genetic material. And that applies to bacteria as well. But there are a couple other characteristics which I'm going to highlight on the next slide. But one other thing is also just a prokaryotic cell is about 10 times smaller than a eukaryotic cell. So these are really teeny tiny microorganisms. All right, so here's a diagram of a bacteria or a bacterium. So bacteria have cell walls, <coughs> excuse me, which are specifically made of peptidoglycan, which is different from the cell wall that makes up a plant or a fungus. They also have a cell membrane because all cells have cell membranes. They have cytoplasms because all cells have cytoplasm. Now, they do not have a nucleus because prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, but instead they have a nucle nucleoid region where their DNA is. And bacteria specifically only have one chromosome. So their DNA is one circular chromosome. That's it. But they also have something called plasmids. Plasmids are small rings of DNA that just have a few genes on them. And they're separate from the one circular chromosome in the nucleoid region. They even replicate separately. And often, when bacteria become resistant to antibiotics, those genes for antibiotic resistance are actually in the plasmid. So that's something we'll talk a little bit more about later when we get into bacteria as pathogens. Bacteria have ribosomes for making proteins because they're cells. They're living things and all cells have ribosomes. Now, some bacteria also have a capsule on the outside of their cell wall, so another structure on the outside as well. And then also for movement, bacteria can have flagella, or this bacteria in this picture has just one, so that's singular for flagellum. They can also have pili, which are these little protrusions here that are all over. So both of those can be used for helping them move. Now, bacteria can be classified a couple different ways, and one way we classify bacteria is by their shape. So there's a bunch of different shapes, but the most common are caucus, which are these circular shapes, um, the bacteria that causes strep throat, also meningitis and pink eye and bacterial pneumonia, they are caucus shaped. 
Another shape is bacillus, which is kind of like a rod shaped. That's what E. coli, which causes some types of food poisoning. That bacteria is this shape right here. And then another one is kind of a spiral shape. Um, Treponema pallidum, it is the bacteria that causes syphilis. That is that spiral shape here. So that's one way that we can classify bacteria is by their shape. Another way is by how they respond to being stained. So this has to do with differences in their cell wall structure will result in when they're stained either a gram positive stain or a gram negative. So gram positive is when a bacteria's cell wall has a lot of peptidoglycan in it. So when it's stained that stain will show up as a purple dye under a microscope. Whereas bacteria that show up gram negative their cell wall has a really thin layer of peptidoglycan but and it also has a polysaccharide layer on the outside of that. So instead of showing purple dye, it actually appears red on the microscope. So the purple is not as easy to tell in this picture from the CDC, but the red is very, very clear. So that's another way we can classify them is how they respond to a gram stain because of their cell structure, cell wall structure. Okay. A couple of uses. Bacteria do so much more than just act as pathogens. Remember, only 1% of bacteria are pathogens. There's so many other things that they do. So, foods like yogurt, cheese, and pickles. Bacteria play a role in all of these. Matter decomposition. We talked about this when we talked about the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle. And really, the nitrogen cycle is run by bacteria. Every step of the nitrogen cycle has a bacteria play a part in it. <coughs> Excuse me. And arguably the most important part of the nitrogen cycle is the way that bacteria make it possible to convert atmospheric nitrogen, elemental nitrogen into into a form that's actually be actually usable by plants that plants can absorb in their roots and then use. So bacteria are huge players in the nitrogen cycle. In humans, they also help us. There are bacteria on our skin that help prevent infections. And there's also bacteria in our gut that help us digest our food. And then lastly is some new developments with biotechnology. There are, is research being done to be able to use bacteria to make antibodies, to make insulin, to make HGH or human growth hormone, to synthesize vitamins and potentially other drugs. So their bacteria are having some major roles outside of just making you sick. So bacteria are really, really awesome. Let's talk about how they reproduce. They are asexual reproducers, thus they reproduce by binary fission. So essentially, it's a very simple process. The nucleoid region where that circular DNA is, um, that circular chromosome, is copied. And then that unicellular organism, that one prokaryotic cell, simply splits in half. So the cytoplasm is split into two, and it yields two identical bacteria. So if we're making identical offspring because we're asexual reproducers, how then are bacteria able to evolve via natural selection? Because one of the key principles of natural selection that causes or allows evolution to occur is having genetic variation. So how could that be introduced? Well, what did we talk about in our evolution unit as being the ultimate source of genetic variation? That is, of course, mutation. Just random change in genetic material that happens typically when that nucleoid region is being copied. So a mutation can occur. But so there are some other things that bacteria do as well that we've never talked about before. One of those being conjugation. So this is when two bacteria cells can transfer DNA between them. Another is transformation. This is when a bacteria cell can take in foreign DNA from its surroundings. And then another type is transduction. This is when a virus will actually transfer genes between two prokaryotic organisms. And these are kind of complicated processes. I'm just introducing those terms to you just so you can appreciate that even though they make identical copies of themselves via asexual reproduction, there can still be genetic variation that's introduced. And this is why we have bacteria that become resistant to antibiotics because they're able to survive despite the fact that we're able to develop these antibiotics against them. 
Okay, that's our brief overview of bacteria. Now let's talk about viruses. Viruses are not considered living things. They do not have metabolism, a way of um, using energy on their own. They cannot reproduce on their own. They are not made of cells. It can also be argued that they can't respond to stimuli or adapt to the environment either on their own. So they are not living things. Instead, we refer to them as biological entities. Okay, so that's very important. They are not alive. They do have genetic material. They either contain DNA, which can be double-stranded DNA like ours, or it actually can be single-stranded DNA, or their genetic material can be RNA, which can be single-stranded like ours, or it can actually be double-stranded. So that's kind of crazy. The key thing about viruses that makes them not living especially is because they have to depend on a living thing to survive. They have to depend on a cell, which is their host, in order to reproduce, use energy, etc. Now, an important term to know, a virus that specifically infects a bacterium is called a bacteriophage. So that's kind of a connection between bacteria and viruses. Note, any cell could be a host to a virus. It doesn't just have to be a bacteria and become a bacteriophage. But most viruses only infect specific cells. So for instance, HIV in humans, it only affects human T cells. So that's something to consider as well. All right, let's talk about the structure of viruses. There is a lot of variety in structure. They can take a lot of different shapes and sizes, as we can see from all these different pictures here. But the main two components are they have a capsid, which is a protein coat on the outside, and then they have some sort of nucleic acid core on the inside, so either DNA or RNA. Remember, no cell membrane, no cytoplasm, no ribosomes, because they are not cells. They're not made of cells. They are not living things. So what can viruses be used for besides making us sick? Well, scientists are doing research on that. They're trying to harness the way that viruses reproduce and take over our cells and use that mechanism to treat diseases like cancer and potentially genetic disorders. They're also being researched as a potential replacement for antibiotics, so that, which are used to treat bacterial diseases, which we'll talk about in concepts two and three. So you don't need to write this whole paragraph. Just know research is being done on them to see if we can use them to treat disease and potentially replace antibiotics. Now let's talk about how they reproduce. Here is the general overview of what they do. A virus will attach to a host cell. The capsid would bind to receptor proteins on the host cell. Then the virus will inject its DNA or its RNA into the host cell. Viral genes from that DNA or RNA are then going to be transcribed and translated into proteins that are then expressed, which yields the host becoming a virus creating factory. Then that host cell bursts, it lyses, and that releases newly formed viruses, which can go and repeat this entire process by attaching to new host cells. So what I just described to you is a lytic life cycle of a virus, but there are actually two different life cycles. So I want to clarify between those. So the lytic life cycle, life cycle that I just described is when that viral DNA or RNA is injected and then it immediately starts transcribing, being transcribed, translated, and expressed. Okay, so we're jumping right in. And then once those, those are in there, you can see in our picture, then the cell, that host cell bursts or lyses, hence the name lytic, and those viruses are released and affect more cells. So this is where a virus is having an immediate impact. I like to think of it as like it's active life cycle. Now in this picture, we're talking about bacteriophages. Remember, that's only when a virus is attaching to a bacteria host cell, but it can attach to other host cells as well. They don't have to be specifically bacteria. All right, the other type of life cycle of a virus, which I find particularly fascinating, is lysogenic life cycle. This is where when that viral DNA or RNA gets injected, it doesn't just immediately start being transcribed and translated and expressed. Instead, it integrates. It becomes part of the host cell's DNA. So when the host cell is copying itself, like cells do, it also starts copying that viral DNA. 
So this viral DNA just keeps getting passed on and passed on in new cells, even because it's incorporated, even though it's not being expressed, meaning it's not being transcribed and translated. This is how viruses can be dormant in your body for years and then be expressed later because something in the environment triggers a change where the virus then goes from this lysogenic life cycle into a lytic cycle where it really starts acting. An example, if you had the chicken pox, that is a virus. You have it when you're younger. That virus can go dormant into this lysogenic life cycle. And then years later, in your 50s, in your 60s, shingles can happen, which is a result. It's that lysogenic chicken pox virus now being expressed again. It's going into the lytic cycle and expressing itself in a new way. This is also how cold sores work. They... Um, can lie in a lysogenic cycle in your nerve cells for years or months. And then when your immune system gets weakened due to something in your environment or even potentially stress, that virus then transitions back to a lytic cycle and starts producing those cold sores. So this is really fascinating about viruses. It's something that really is amazing to think about and important as we talk about how viruses can be diseases in our next concepts and how we are supposed to treat viral diseases. Okay, so we're going to do an activity in my class with some task cards, and then we're going to come back and kind of do this summary chart comparing and contrasting bacteria and viruses because I really want to make sure you have these differentiated and we have a solid foundation before we move more into our pathogens unit. So that's all for concept one.